Viktor Frankl said, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson. Stay tuned for the next hour as Sue explores the human psyche, what makes us tick and how to live better, more fulfilled and more meaningful lives. Only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program on 101.9 High FM. Thanks so much for joining me today and my guest, Rene Posniak. And our topic today is to bear witness. Rene is a Holocaust educator, Jewish studies teacher. She's worked with the, organ the international organization March of the Living, which takes tours to, to Poland, to the uh, various um, concentration camps and she is um, incredibly knowledgeable about the Holocaust but she has also just come back from Israel and been a witness there. If you hear any noise going on around us it's because we're actually sitting on her patio in this building next door. Um, we, we just needed to do it from home today so that's why we're here. Now, um, Rene went to Israel, and we're going to discuss that shortly, because what we don't understand, and often it's overlooked, is the fact that there are thousands of misplaced um, and replaced Israelis on the north and the south who are refugees in their own country and have been put up in hotels and all uh, homes all over, but on, have not been able to go back. You can hear a bit of shouting from next door. Don't worry about it. It is builders. Okay. <laughs> um, a billboard at a pro-Israel march said, the more you attack Jews around the world, the more you prove Israel. Please tell me a bit about your experiences on March of the Living. Hi, Sue. So thank you. Um, as you know, most of my life has been about studying Jewish history, but particularly Jewish persecution. Trying to understand it, uh, in, and, and all I can say is that I've been to Poland several times, and the more I go, the less I understand it. It just makes no sense. But I do know that a central takeaway message of any of the trips or any of the courses at Yad Vashem or in the United States is an encouragement to go and see the evidence. Go and see the truth. Become a witness. And when you become a witness, the responsibility comes with that as well. And that is to share what you've seen. And it's also to educate in the hope that it would never happen again. And with your, when you educate, what is your method of educating because I've sat in for quite a few of your your lectures and you really do touch the souls of the people that you're lecturing to and the children. Uh, Rene, by the way, is a very good friend of mine, so we have shared a lot. And I might add, we're both also our avid um, educator, uh, educators of ourselves. We've, we can discuss most things because we've looked them up on Google or Safari, our best friends. <laughs> okay, Ren. Um, Sue, uh, my experience with the youth has been that it's, it's, a very, it's a big challenge to teach something like the Holocaust because a lot of them will say this happened 79 years ago, 75 years ago. On the other side of the world, what's that actually got to do with me? I also think that it's a generation that is very desensitized to violence. Mm. They're actually quite comfortable with seeing uh, heaps of bodies lying around or people that were shot. How do you make them feel? How do you make them res How do you make this history that is so vital to us resonate? There's also a, a balance to not only define ourselves by the Holocaust. We are so much more than that. So. To, to, you know, continually show the good side and the wonderful blessing that we are as a people. Um, so, it, it, for me, with the Holocaust, it's very much a trip into your imagination because a lot of what you're trying to show doesn't exist anymore. Mm. So, the way you do that is with stories, 
with testimonies, with eyewitnesses, and you have to recreate what happened. So if you can't, re if you can't find a method to resonate with your audience, what you're doing is absolutely useless. So true. You know, and it takes me back to a time that when Shiva and I were on your, uh, one of your tours to Poland and we were at Madanik, and Shira and I had sort of broken away from the group a little bit and we were watching an Australian group. And they were, what, they were looking at, um, uh, it was a big display cabinet with Nazi, I mean, with the, the uh, inmates' uniforms and what have you. And they had a, a, a survivor with them. And this survivor was standing there and you could literally see him almost change personality. Suddenly, he was showing them how you put on your cap and took off your cap. It was an imaginary cap that he was holding. But you could actually see this person when he was young. And Shira and I were really devastated by his story. Anyway, a bit later, um, our group moved on. And Shira and I waited. And we, we thought we'd see him, and, and he wasn't there. But he was sitting outside on the pavement outside Madonna, mm -hmm. looking he had his hand, his head in his hand, looking absolutely distraught. And we said to him, can we help you? And he asked if he could tell us his story. Amazing. And he did. And his story was one of the most unbelievable. It, it will touch my soul and Shira's soul for life. He was 16 and he was at the in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, his family had all already been sent to, to Auschwitz. And it was his job every day to clean the ghetto of all the bodies that had been killed, people dying of, of, uh, of disease, of being shot, of starvation. And he had to clean up. And one day he said he was, at, he was looking out of his bed and he had a little slit room and he was looking and he saw the moon and the stars. And he said he spoke to Hashem and he said, please, if, if you help me survive, I will go on teaching about this experience for the rest of my life. And he did survive. And that's what he did do. Wow. And we met with him in Jerusalem afterwards. You know how your group always goes on to Jerusalem. And he was with this crowd of school people. They were all dressed as Shabbos. They were all sitting on the steps outside our hotel when he walked up. And they all got up to hug him. He was a different person. He was alive. And I actually said to him, good heavens, you have definitely lived your promise. And he said, Hashem lived his promise to me. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely so, touches the soul, that. It is those sort of stories that do touch the soul. You've got your own story because you, when you decided to be an educator, a Holocaust educator, um, I'm going to just have to go. We're going to go to an ad break in a sec. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program, and I'm back with Rene Posniak, and I'll, we are talking about to bear witness. Rene is going to uh, tell us a bit about why she decided when I might add she was in a lot of pain at the time and all her friends, me included, tried to get her to not go to Israel, but she was absolutely determined. What was your determination? Well, I think, Sue, in light of my history of um, pursuing or looking at, at, at the persecution of Jews and having gone to Poland so often, when, this, when October 7th happened, I think that the Jewish world was in absolute shock. And that is just for want of a better word, because shock just doesn't really describe it. Traumatized. I think it's also important to understand that I'm sure it was not only the Jewish world that was traumatized, but the whole world. For me, I needed to go and see the evidence, like I had needed to do with Poland. I needed to become a witness again. And I needed to share it and hopefully educate some more. I don't think anyone believed that in our lifetime we were going to again witness such hatred for nothing more than being Jews. And I think now even more so for being Israelis. Uh, listening the other night to Colonel uh, Mary Eisen, who was absolutely fascinating on the Jewish Report webinar, uh, Zoom, Zoom call, 
she said something, she said lots of things that really resonated with me. But the one thing that I've, that I've really remembered is when somebody asked her why the IDF was so, appeared to be so unprepared or the intelligence. Mm. And she said that you cannot prepare or even entertain something that is unimaginable. And what happened there is unimaginable. It's so evil. That's, uh, I think we've never experienced evil like that. And you mentioned something to me about the difference between the Nazis and the Hamas terrorist attack. What, what did you feel about that? What did you say? So, so standing there in the south at the kibbutzim that had been violated and standing at the Nova, at the site of the Nova uh, Music Festival, and then standing again in, in uh, Hostage Square on Women's Day, it shook me so much, the level of evil, the depravity of what had gone on there. It's a hard thing to admit, but I think that it shook me even more than when I stood at Auschwitz, Madanik, Treblinka, and all the other camps. So why? Why was I so shaken, having experienced this other terrible trauma? And I think, first of all, because it was in real time. Mm. It was fresh. It was happening now. And it was, I just could sense a level of evil that I'd never sensed somehow in Poland. In answer to your question, a lot of what the Nazis did, they hid. They, they had big pits and they burned the evidence. They used rubber tires to ignite the fire. This depravity happened on GoPro. The whole world was, could, you could watch it live. Mm. And then you could hear them making calls home, how excited they were that they'd raped a Jew or beheaded a Jewish baby or whatever. That is something that is inexplicable. That's absolute depravity. Yeah. And it, I think it is something that we are all really, really battling with. You know that uh, Elisha uh, Bizel, Elie Bizel's um, uh, uh, son, w was saying that his father spoke about uh, having Israel and you know he could really understand why we needed Israel after the Holocaust and he, he, he was asked how he felt about what was happening with the, the, after the 7th of October and he said he, he actually just could not believe that this could be happening and he's been going through all his father's um, his work, and one of the things that he quoted that Elie Wiesel said is, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Of course, indifference can be tempting. More than that, seductive. It is so much easier to look away from victims. It is so much easier to look away and to avoid rude interruptions of our hopes and our dreams. Absolutely. But there's a peril in that. Yeah. And at the moment, we are also being questioned about indifference ourselves. And as feeling human beings, as you and I are, we are also asking, how can this be happening? The, what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Israel with our IDF, when we see the images of children, the heartbreak that I know I feel for the children, when I see the pain of the children in in Palestine, in, in Gaza. What do you think, Bren? Very hard to put words to, to this. Um, I would like to tell you a story. Okay. Which really had a big shift in, for me. We have a, a narrative of our own history, of the Holocaust, of, of what's going on in the Middle East. And it's truth, and it's our truth, and it's, 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 it's horrendous. I went on a course to Yad Vashem uh, years ago, uh, which was for Holocaust educators from around the world. And um, when we arrived there, I was the only South African. When we arrived there, we were put in a circle in one of the, the seminar rooms at Yad Vashem, and we were asked to introduce ourselves to the group. Your name, and just, just briefly, why have you come on a course like this? Three-week, very intense course. First of all, I was very fascinated by the group. 
what fascinated me were two things in particular. One was that there was a group of Catholic nuns that had come to, they wanted to try to understand what had happened in the Holocaust and the stand that the, that the Catholic Church took at the time. And we, we went around the group and the very last person to speak was, a, was, was a, a man, I'm not sure, maybe in his mid-twenties, maybe 30, I don't know his age. And he, he gave his name in a thick German accent, and he said he doesn't want to discuss why he had come on the course, which, of course, just intrigued all of us. We then proceeded on a very intense course where we were six days a week at Yad Vashem from morning to night. And, in fact, even an Israeli psychiatrist or psychologist was stationed facing us the whole time to see our reaction to what it is we were being exposed to. He never said one single word in three weeks. Everybody else had cried, shouted, screamed, debated. We knew each other pretty well. One of the, the participants was a young Australian girl, and she said that she had come on the course because her parents had been victims during the Holocaust, I'm not sure where, and they'd, they'd hidden in a cave and lived off grass and insects and whatever they could, you know, scourge around. And she wanted to understand, how do people do this to other people? How do you, how do you explain this? Anyway, we had very little free time, but when we did have free time, we would go to uh, um, one of the roads there and we would walk around and we would get ice creams and it was so hot. And occasionally we saw this German walking with the Australian girl. Never thought much of it because he just didn't want to communicate at all. The night before we were going to finish the course, the director came and he said, I'm going to let you have a closing ceremony. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a flame that burns at Yad Vashem all the time and it's open to the public. He said, I'm going to cordon it off for an hour. And you could have a closing ceremony there. So we had drawn up a bit of an agenda of a few speeches that some of us would make. I was going to speak on behalf of diaspora jury. Um, anyway, we, we arrived there. It was very powerful, very quiet. We each got up to speak. And when the ceremony was over, the young German man got up and he walked up to the podium. Everybody was staring at him because we, he, he just had not participated at all even though he never missed one minute of the course. And he picked up the mic, and he, in his thick German accent, he said, I came on this course, and I've made a friend. And we all assumed, and I'm sure correctly so, that it was the Australian girl. Mm. And he said, her parents were victims of my parents, mm. and she's forgiven me. And now I'm going to go home and try and start my life properly. And he put the mic down. He walked out and nobody ever saw him again. Hmm. Even when I tell the story now, years later, the hair just stands up on my arm. And it was such a shock for my, for my consciousness that actually there are other victims. Hmm. Hmm. You know, there's not a, a black and white, you right, you wrong. There are other victims. And that it made me understand that there are other narratives, that for other people is their truth. Um, and while the, I, there's absolutely no condemnation whatsoever of what happened uh, on, on, on October the 7th, no condemnation of the tunnels, no condemnation of the fact that they're stealing medicine and food from their own people. But I think that education without some kind of moral uh, uh, compass is actually has actually got no value. Absolutely, our kids are too smart. They're not going to accept mm -hmm. a one-sided. We are known to be very moral people, and I think that's something that needs to when be you preserved. say we, the yeah. Jews, the mm -hmm. Jewish people mm -hmm. are known to be very moral, or that's certainly our what we strive to be, and uh, it's very important that. Um, there's an understanding that there's a human, there's a huge human tragedy taking place, and and, and our students recognise that, and we need to allow them mm. to recognise that, and also to look at our own moral duty 
And, you know, Viktor Frankl was actually ostracized by uh, Jewish communities all over the world for saying that he did not believe in collective guilt. That uh, how, how do we know? And, and I must admit, you know, I often thought about that, but it's become very real to me since this, the, the uh, 7th of October massacre by the terrorists, Hamas. Because we saw in that massacre our people, our young Jewish girls, men, women, old, the elderly, the young, the atrocities that had happened to them. We saw them being dragged off. And we saw ordinary, what we thought were ordinary Palestinians celebrating and singing and helping them being dragged off. Right now, they don't even know where most of the hostages are. And we found uh, the hostages that we released, we actually found, were found in, in, in a Palestinian's uh, house. So we are left thinking, well, I am left wondering, this collective blame, I've got to really understand, I've got to see. And I think it was last night I heard someone talking on CNN. It was a woman who had lost her, ch her child and her husband from Israeli bombing. And, and she said, I blame uh, Hamas and the IDF. So she was putting blame on both. But I have been really struggling with this, Ren, you know, thinking to myself, yeah. how many were actually involved? And, you know, are we going to let them back into the country? What is the future going to be? I don't know any of the answers. I don't think that the Israeli government know any of the answers. I don't think anybody does. I think that everything is going to play out and it's not going to happen overnight. I just want to try and ensure that we keep our humanity, <coughs> that we keep our moral compass, and that we don't educate the way Palestinian kids are being educated. Mm. We don't to, to that that everybody that's not a Jew is bad or and make people scared of other people. Um, for me, that's very important. It's a, a very important part of what has happened here is what do we do with this? How mm. do, what do we learn from this? And, of course, one of the, the big outgrowths of this is this unbelievable explosion of global anti-Semitism, something that I don't believe is new, I think it's probably always been there, but it's almost becoming normalized and acceptable because every day we're seeing an, an incident somewhere and it's not hidden. Nobody's shying away from it. No. Nobody's denying it. And uh, that's very, very worrying. Very worrying. And even there was an article uh, yesterday about the New York Police Department and the way they were handling anti-Semitic incidents and it seemed to be pretty much they were allowing, like, the, the pro, uh, I mean, yeah, the pro Hamas supporters in more into when the, the different places were being torched and keeping the pro Israeli ones out. So there seems to be a distortion at the moment of what is acceptable and what isn't. And nobody seems to know, there's no moral voice. No moral voice in the world today that can actually say it. And, and one of the other things that Elie Bizal did say, which I think is amazing, because he said so many things could actually make him shamed as a Jew. And that Bizal was no stranger to suffering, but he said indifference is not a beginning. It is an end. And therefore, indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never his victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. Wow. And at the moment, I think that's what the world is seeing. And we are actually being, we as Jews are being forgotten. Yeah, so, and they, you know, I, don't, I think people are really shocked. Absolutely shocked. Now, Ren, I also wanted you to talk about the resilience that you noticed. That, I think, is a huge thing. So that was, it, it's almost like a schizophrenic experience because when you're in Tel Aviv and you're in Jerusalem. That's now. That's now. Mm. It's, the, 
it's packed. The restaurants are full. There's dancing on the beachfront. There is unbelievable resilience. You can't believe that we're in the middle of a, of a very, very serious war. And then you go down south, and it's a completely different story. We also stayed in, in a hotel that was at least 50% uh, people that had been, are being evacuated, had been evacuated from the south. And I found that also very, very sad to watch. They're living in rooms for months and months on end. They are not, as, they're not big city people, a lot of them. They come from Kibbutzim, that even life in the big city is something that is foreign. Um, it, the, the hotels become their home. They come, some of them come down to breakfast in their pajamas, which is absolutely fine. They, it's not offensive at all. This is their home. Mm. And I found that that dynamic to be, and it's almost in every hotel mm. that you will, mm. you'll see this. So the resilience is something unbelievable. I, don't, I do think that Israelis are, that it's a traumatized country. I do think so. But I do think that the, the ability to, to, to be resilient is absolutely phenomenal. I just couldn't believe it. I, you almost feel guilty to sit somewhere and laugh and, and then you go down south, there's a, such abject horror that you see. So it, it, it was a very, it's a, it's a very ex interesting experience. We were there in February. So, and, and now it's, it's, it's months. This has gone on, I think we're in the eighth or ninth mm. month. And I, there doesn't seem to be an end to it. No. In fact, if anything, a potential acceleration with Lebanon in the north, with mm. Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. So it's very worrying. It really is. And you know what I think also what's very worrying with, with our, our IDF, who are known to be a moral army, they are, a lot of them are, are, are what we would call having a moral injury. You know, yes. they are seeing what's happening and we are not, we're not killers. Uh, our young boys and girls are not made to be killers. We haven't brought them up Absolutely. like that. And all of a sudden, they're having to go in and, and, and fight this unjust, unbelievably difficult war. It's almost guerrilla warfare. It's, it's unknown to, to our people. And so you have that, that it's called moral injury and it's part of a post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. And I actually believe that this is something that Israel is going to be having to deal with in the future. Do you agree? Absolutely. I think that's going to be one of the main challenges uh, besides rebuilding the damage that's been done and who knows what's going to happen in the north um, to deal with the trauma that people who, that, that have had to live through um, I don't know how you heal that. Mm. I think that's going to be very difficult and uh, very worried. But I think the whole world at the, no at the moment seems to be a bit traumatized. Very much so. I mean, you see what's going on in London. And, you know, uh, Douglas Murray, uh, well, I like what Douglas Murray actually says. He's definitely a very good friend to yes. the Jews and to Israel. But he was saying that, when he sees the resilience of our youngsters in Israel, he's blown away because people were sort of brushing them aside and saying, this is the generation who won't know how to, to step forward. We're going to get back to that shortly. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program. If you would like to SMS us, please do so on 34519 or you can telegram on 61 I'm back with Rene Pozniak and we are talking about our topic is to bear witness. And for those of you who haven't, uh, have only just tuned in, you can always pick up our podcasts on the Chai FM podcast uh, programs, um, apps, uh, and you'll find us under Finding Human. Now, we're going to be listening to a, a YouTube by Elie Wiesel, The World is Not Learning Anything. Sure, my friend, you know how many reasons we have 
to be desperate and despairing. The world is not learning anything. Really. We have seen that. Uh, you and I went through certain experiences. If anyone had told us in 1945 that there are certain battles we'll have to fight again, we wouldn't have believed it. Right. Racism, anti-Semitism, uh, starvation of children, who would have believed that? At least I was convinced then, naively, that uh, at least something happened in history that because of, let's say, Auschwitz, uh, certain things will not happen again. I was convinced that hatred among nations and among people perished in Auschwitz. It didn't. The victims died. But the haters are still here, new ones. And so often I say to myself, really, what are we doing on this planet? We are, we are passing the message as well as we can, communicating our fears, our hopes. And day in, day out, week after week and year after year, people kill each other. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program on 101.9 High FM. My guest today is my friend, Rene Posniak, and we are talking about To Bear Witness. Um, there was one thing that I wanted to say. That was Eli Wiesel talking, and he said, you know, the haters are still here. Yes. And, I mean, those words couldn't be more true. But I wanted to tell you a nice story about... Uh, Elie Wiesel and Rabbi Lau, that um, it's, it's called, I picked it up on, on Google, it says, Alive, Trace's Journey of Boys Hidden in a Concentration Camp. And it's a movie, it's a story. And uh, this Holocaust scholar, Fred Rosenbaum, was directing it. And he was saying that when American soldiers liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp near Weimar, Germany, on April 1945, more than 900 boys, ages 7 through to 18, most of whom had been sheltered in a clandestine underground barrack, were found alive. Wow. They had witnessed and been the victims of unspeakable cruelty. And yet, incredibly, they went on to have productive, meaningful lives. The odds-defying scope of these orphans' children from pre-war Jewish life with their families through their rescue and into adulthood is the subject of a, of a superb new traveling photo exhibition, which sounds amazing. I mean, look at that resilience. Wow. But uh, the exhibit uh, illustrates the remarkable orchestrated efforts of a group of non-Jewish political prisoners led by the Czech communist Antonin Kalina, who were determined to keep these youngsters, most of them very vulnerable youth, alive. They were hidden to avoid hard labor and surreptitiously given extra food, um, which is just so amazing. And then it, uh, it goes on uh, quite a bit more. But among the hundreds of liberated children who were transported to France after the war were 16-year-old Elie Wiesel, who would later receive the Nobel mm. Prize, and 8-year-old Mayer Lau, who would become Israel's longtime chief rabbi. Wow. And you know, there's a, a photograph, one of the exhibition's photos is, is of a smiling um, Mayer Lau after liberation, wearing a Hitler youth uniform, which was the only clothes available, and clutching his little suitcase. Mm. And Rosenbaum said, this touches him, the, me so deeply. It shows the moment that is the pivot between slavery and and freedom. It's the very moment when a boy is embarking on the unknown. And you know, Ren, I know that Rabbi Lau, Maya Lau, has been on many of the um, uh, March, March of, the of the Living. Yeah. Very special. And spoken. 
the thing that he always says, which I never forget, besides the fact that he's a very um, charismatic presence in a room, is he speaks about forgiveness. And he says that only the victim can forgive. Mm. Nobody mm. else has the right to do that. Mm. And I think that that's probably an issue we're going to start looking at as well. It's, forgiveness and blame and culpability. Yes, very definitely. What? How do you teach people at the Holocaust when you're doing uh, studies and when you've taught school? How do you teach about blame? I think blame is a... I think it becomes very subjective. I don't think you can get everybody in a room to agree on the source of blame or, or what to do about the blame. Um, I think that you're always going to have different perspectives. You know, are you, are you a, a freedom fighter or a terrorist doing the same thing? So... I think, I think it's more than teaching about blame. It's teaching about being human, about mm. being moral, about being kind. Um, is there a, an objective, standalone measure of what's right and wrong? Um, I don't know. And you know, when you say what's right and wrong, both Elie Bezel's um, son, Elisha Bezel, and Viktor Frankl's son, um, Vasily, can't remember his first name just offhand, um, they have gone on to teach about meaning, to teach about uh, accepting the other and not looking and putting others into a box. Yeah. And I find that I myself am having to watch myself doing that, and I know a lot of people are. You go into a shopping centre and you know that you're being seen as a, as a Jew and you are looking at other people who are a different uh, religion to us, perhaps, you know, with burqas on and what yeah. have you. And we are now inclined, I don't know about you, but many people have said to me they never thought they would get to the stage of looking with anger at the other. I think everybody is doing that. Mm. And I think that's the, the, the real tragedy and the real worry about what is going on. So what advice would you give to people who are thinking perhaps of going to the South uh, or the North? Um, and what, what advice would you give them to come back? What, would, what do you feel they should come back with? Well, first of all, I, th I don't know if it's for everybody to physically go. Right. I know that when I, on my trips to Poland, I wanted to see the bricks and the mortar and the graves. And it, it's not the same as in a textbook. What you can achieve in a trip like that, especially with, with uh, youth, you can't achieve in, a, in, in, in many hours in a, in a classroom. Absolutely. So I, I think it's very important to go down there, but I acknowledge that it's not for everyone. Not for everyone. Thank you, Craig. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program. And our time is going very quickly. We've got another YouTube to listen to. Have you got it there, Craig? Okay. For it TV, the world is thinking. That there will be questions. I'm sure, about Israel. What is happening in Israel? I, as a Jew, am totally committed to my historic land, which was the land of Abraham and Moses, although Moses had not entered it. And therefore, I, who love America, I came here as a refugee and studied and taught, and whatever I could do, I couldn't have done the same thing anywhere else but here. But still, Jerusalem has a special place in my heart. I don't live there. I don't live in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem lives in me. And therefore, I say, there are certain things there which break my heart. Is it Israel's fault? Wait a second. First of all, it's surely the fault of today's Palestinian young people's ancestors. Because in 1947, when the United Nations adopted the part partition resolution 
it was accepted by Israel right away. And that resolution wanted a Jewish state and an Arab state. The word Palestinian wasn't even mentioned because historically there was never a Palestinian state. It's true all that. Had they accepted it, Jerusalem would have remained internationalized. Lida would have been airport, Palestinian or Arab. What else? Jaffa, which is part of Tel Aviv, would, would have been Arab or they would have called it later Palestinian. It's their fault. And therefore I say, today's young people have all the right in the world to be angry at their ancestors. Why, didn't, why did they lose such an opportunity? They could have accepted it. But nevertheless, today there is a human reality when there are a few million people who want to live in peace and they are Palestinians. And I believe, together with so many other Israeli leaders, including even the latest one, Netanyahu, in the two-state resolution. We should have two, an Arab, a Palestinian state, a Jewish state, simply to live in peace with one another. Is it possible? It is. I organize very frequently Nobel laureates conferences. For the last few years, I did it together with King Abdallah of Jordan, and I am the one who brought for, together for the first time Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, and Ayoud Olmert, who was then prime minister. And when they met for the first time, they fell into each other's arms for a long, long moment, and we had tears in our eyes. It's possible. I think violence must stop. Terrorism must stop. Sure, surely suicide terrorism, which is a blemish on whatever human story, whatever human life is, they must stop. But it's possible, in spite of everything, or I say, as yet, hope. There, there too, is possible. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program on 101.9 High FM. I'm being told to wrap up. I just wanted to end with this. Um, Nama Levy turned 20 years old this week while in the hands of the genocidal Hamas terrorists in Gaza. And when she was younger, she took part in the Hands of Peace project with Palestinians to promote mutual understanding. She was taken handcuffed by, as a hostage by Hamas. She was injured, she was terrified, and she's just turned 20. Nama, please God, you will come home safely. And I think what we have to understand, and I would like to just say thank you, Ren, for being on my program with me. Have you got a message that you would like to end with? The same message that uh, Elie Wiesel is ending with, just let there be peace Absolutely. and coexistence and hope. And hope. Let's end on that because we are each other's hope. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Vusi. And thank you, Makundi.